much. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone. I hope you had a good breakfast. I know it's like a bit early in the morning, but yeah, I'm really excited for this talk. I don't think this is the first time you're hearing ChatGPT this week. <laughs> so I think like, uh, you know, as we delve down, you'll learn more about it and also learn about, you know, our progress as such and what we learned throughout this process. And so, yeah, um, let me go ahead. So uh, I'm Archana. So I'm currently a data product manager with Women Who Code. Um, I'm wearing their very cool shirt as well. And if you do come to the event hall, I think you can catch our booth, uh, both Women Who Code Seoul and uh, Singapore. And apart from that, I'm also a board member with Women in Machine Learning, which is another uh, nonprofit. And yeah, I also produce courses on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, I've one on Learning Tiny ML, and we have another one coming out on ML Ops uh, with uh, Vertex AI. Uh, that's maybe coming out in a month. Both of us have produced that. And uh, yeah, I'll let Soham go ahead and... Um, yeah, hi, I'm Soham. Um, I'm currently the machine learning lead at a startup in Singapore called uh, Sleek. Um, so yeah, um, as I said, you know, probably this is not the first time you're hearing ChatGPT this week. And so uh, we just this is a short preview of what we made. I hope this sort of makes sense and you know um, as we dive into it I know that we can't really walk you through exactly you know how we build but we can in the 25 minutes but for sure we can uh, give you the access to the github and so on and so yeah so today's agenda is what are we building today a peek into like GPT as such and most importantly, we want to talk about what they don't tell you about building these LLM products. And then finally, like ways to contribute. So yeah, let's start with the first thing, you know, what, uh, firstly, yeah, we definitely wanted to try our hands into LLMs. Uh, but most importantly, like, you know, most of us here, maybe like even me, right? I, I speak three languages. So in my head, I'm always translating between all of them. So yeah, I um, one of the things that I oftentimes face is English accessibility problem, right? We oftentimes convert the text to English or in our head or otherwise, and maybe it doesn't sound right. So I thought this is like a perfect example for chat GPT to help out with. And so I went like I tried to figure out like on the web, like if there are people similar to me. So there turns out it is. So do you know that more than, you know, half of the world's population speaks at least two languages and many people tend to think and work in their native language? Over 75% of consumers prefer to buy products in their native language, highlighting the importance of language accessibility. And 50% website visitors will leave if they can't read or understand the context and indicating a significant barrier for non-native English speakers. So... In short, long and complex English texts can be difficult for many people, including those with reading or learning disabilities, elderly individuals, or individuals with limited English proficiency. So yeah, I think this is a great segue into talking about GPT. Um, just trying to make it easy for people to um, uh, for bilingual people to um, and people who speak more than one language to, um, you know, talk in English, um, write in English, and also, um, uh, you know, like uh, do communicate business English better. Um, and we're trying to do that with GPT. Um, so I'm sure you've heard of Chat GPT by now. Um, what it is is it's a language model um, that was created by OpenAI. Um, I think GPT is like the most uh, famous uh, one right now, but there's a lot of others that people are working on. Um, the biggest language model that I think the, has been released so far is um, GPT-4. Um, it's been trained on data till September 2021. And um, a really cool thing about these models is they have this thing called emergent abilities, uh, which is they can do tasks that they have not been trained on um and um and they can generalize across a lot of different tasks right um and and gpt how it was trained to do this was take uh, feedback from humans and learn how humans want um uh, want the gpt to answer questions 
and 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 GPT will kind of try to emulate that, right? Um, so so how you interact with it is through natural language, and it also replies with natural language. Um, but the problem with GPT models are that they're very large. Um, I think anything more than uh, GPT-2, which is, you know, 1.5 billion, it's pretty much out of the realm of, you know, startups, open source companies, um, and and even, you know, mid-sized mid -size companies to train. Um, and, and if you want to deploy them, you have to kind of deploy them on GPUs, um, sometimes even multiple GPUs to make sure that the latency is less, um, right? Uh, but, but, you know... Um, it, it's really good at so many tasks um, that it, uh, that these models right now serve as kind of like a, b a baseline or a benchmark um, when you're trying to build new tasks, and 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 that's why you know you you can't really ignore them at all right now, and you have to use them. Um, and I'll talk more about that in some time. Um, but but yeah, so um, so you know we saw this, we got really excited. We saw a lot of other people building products with it, and we you know we thought, okay, let's let's try building something. It seems pretty simple, um, and you know we'll just make it open source. We'll deploy it, and hopefully learn a lot of things along the way. Um, so yeah, that that was like the first step. Um, so we started building, and you know it's really easy We're using GPT to go from zero to one and build something that's modestly reliable and and you know it works pretty well um, and you can do that using something called prompt engineering where you know you create these natural language text prompts um, that and that tell the model what to do and it'll you know rep, uh, it'll, it works most of the time it replies with what you want it to reply right but then you know the, it, it's different when you're trying to build like a pet project that you might use from time to time or demo at a few places and and it's and, and GPT works really well at that, but when you try to take that to production, um, that's when other problems come up. Uh, problems like cost, right? Um, how much it takes to run these models, um, latency, how long it takes to get a response from the model, um, and also how reliable and uh, scalable the solution is, right? And, and, and this is like stage four, where, you know, we're super impressed by the capability of the model, uh, but also, it kind of lacks in a lot of ways and it's like it's not reliable and it's expensive right and that's the point where you get really overwhelmed trying to fine-tune these prompts trying to make sure the costs are less the latency is less um it's really difficult to uh, to make that work um so so yeah um uh, before i move on to like the problems and stuff um um, there's also another issue, which is because this field and the, these kind of models are so new, um, there's not a lot of uh, standards or best practices uh, for how to even go about deploying them, right? Um, so, so that's also something we're trying to learn while building this. Right now, our architecture is like really simple. Uh, the um, extension um, connects to like the extension backend, uh, which uh, which sends a request to our Python backend um, that you know that. Or connects with OpenAI's API, and and you know we it, it it sends back the result which which goes back to the front end. Um, both me and Archana, we we've worked like uh, our whole lives in backend in Python. We have like very little JavaScript or front end experience, right? I um I can't even center a div in CSS. Um, so um so so you know what. The front end as well as the um, the JavaScript backend for the um, uh, for the extension was actually built using ChatGPT, um, and it took us like an hour with like almost no JavaScript experience. Um, so yeah, so with that, I want to talk about like some of the challenges that we face while building this. I think the biggest challenge is issues with the API. Um, OpenAI has like kind of openly like they've come out and said like you know we have no SLAs for our product for our API, uh, we have no um, latency or uptime uh, SLAs, and 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 they'll be really happy to randomly deprecate um, models and and um, and uh, um, yeah just just deprecate models right. So so when we started building this, we were building this on an op uh, on and on the the Vinci 002 model. Uh, we, you know, we I, uh, we created a few prompts that were working really well. Um, uh, fine tuned them to make them work better. Uh, and then a few weeks into the project, they they said that they're deprecating that endpoint, 
um, and and you know you should now move to this new endpoint. Um, transitioning to the new endpoint, it's easy. You just change where you're you know where you're calling the the, mod, the how you're calling their API. Um, but the prompts they don't work as well anymore. Um, right, we the the prompts are not as reliable. Sometimes they don't give the kind of outputs we expect, um, and and so you know we had this really well built flesh, kind of fleshed out product, but then um, we couldn't transition to the new API, and that that would take a lot of effort. Um, at the same time, while they when they release this new API, uh, this new endpoint and this new model, um, they I think they stopped. Um, Putting resources into their previous model, the one that which we had built our, our product on, um, and so our latency increased from like a few seconds to like minutes, right? And that you know that just makes the whole thing really unreliable. And um, uh, as as someone who's trying to build products around this, um, unscalable as well, I think. Um, another issue is with prompts and how you engineer prompts. So because you're talking. To the model using natural language, um, natural language it's ambiguous. Um, you know, um, uh, you can infer lots of meanings from it, um, and so prompts are also ambiguous, right? And it's very hard to get reproducibility. Um, very hard to um, get the same result from the model even using the same prompts. And the model also tends to hallucinate, and which is basically like it'll t tend to make up answers or give you wrong answers, but it'll do that really confidently, right? Um, which which is also an issue, right? Because how do you even serve like the result of your of the model if you're not sure how confident uh, you should be of that result? Um, and and you know as as these products g get more complex, what you do is you chain uh, like results from mod one model to um, to another model, and then that gives a different result, and then that goes on. Um, and you also have like agents, which is like uh, models that can do some tasks, so maybe like you know, query a SQL database, um, search something on the internet, stuff like that. These are really inconsistent. They work like one third of the time at best, right? Um, and if they fail, especially if you have long chains, so let's say the chain fails in between, um, it's very hard to recover from that failure. A because you don't even you can't tell if the chain has failed in the first place. And and secondly, um, I don't know if you've used ChatGPT, but if you tell them like, hey, you've made a mistake, this is what you should do, it's very hard to get the uh, get the um, get it back on track, right? Um, it'll just say something like, oh, I'm sorry, and then keep making the same error. Um, and there's also no evaluation metrics for these errors, right? Because it's natural language, you can't really evaluate whether the output is correct or not. Um, and finally, like trust and security. Um, so recently, OpenAI kind of uh, Brought up, took up this like um, uh, I don't know some policy or something where they said that um, uh, if you you can opt out of data collection, especially for training and all, um, which is great because that was a big concern for a lot of companies. Uh, but then the other concern is we don't actually know what data was used to train their model, right? Um, so you know what if you're building like let's say um, uh, something that does financial modeling whatever right accounting maybe and what if that were or like you know like stocks and stuff um what if what if open ai trained their model on data from like reddit's uh, the wall street bets subreddit right you you don't want that kind of data in your model right or or maybe you're doing like some kind of medical diagnosis right uh, you want to make sure your model was not trained on data that consists of um incorrect you know misinformation or like you know malicious information um, and then finally, uh, prompt injections and attacks. It's like almost every day that people are um, creating new ways to, um, you know, attack these models, make it to act um, in malicious ways or adversarial ways, um, and it's very hard to defend against them. Um, so these are some of the challenges. Um, but then um, it's it's not that bad. There's still some solutions to it. Um, the I think the first thing I want to talk about is like the cost of the model. Um, so when you, uh, I think what OpenAI has done with this is they've um, reduced the barrier to entry uh, for startups and for companies to actually build uh, smart, intelligent products, right? Um, because you know previously you would have to hire like a team of data scientists and engineers to build um, to build like any uh, AI machine learning based product, right? And that's expensive, and you don't even know if that product will work or not. Um, in the end, 
So, uh, but what OpenAI has done is it's kind of made it very easy to just write a few prompts and get a product up and running very quickly. Um, but then, as you as your product grows in complexity and and as you get new users, um, your API costs start to like exponentially increase, right? So that's what you see in the first half of the uh, first one third of that uh, chart over there. Uh, which is as as your product grows in complexity, your costs will kind of skyrocket, and it'll be um, it'll make your business unsustainable. Um, so what you have to do is very quickly um, move on and fine tune a model. This will also allow you to uh, make sure the model is trained on on you know like um, more relevant data. So it gives you more relevant outputs. It might reduce incorrect outputs from the model. It might also make your outputs more um, uh, more manageable. Um, and then also um, it reduces costs, especially if you can deploy that model on premise, right? Uh, but the costs don't decrease a lot um, the, uh, because you still have to deploy that model on a GPU, maybe multiple GPUs. Um, and also um, you have the same problem where uh, even, th even though you might not be paying for an API, if your um, prompts increase, if your application complexity increases, uh, your costs will increase a lot as well. And so it's at that point that you have to kind of um, start training a custom model. Um, so what I would like, what I think will happen in the future is um, you'll have to do this um, process of buy while you build um, out your solution, right? So it'll help small companies, uh, startups uh, challenge incumbents uh, because you know they can build out products really quickly. So that's the buy versus build um, problem and, and solution. Um, some of the other solutions, so um, for prompt engineering, what we've seen work is like few shot prompting, which is where you give some context about the problem. Um, and then you um, provide also some um, format, uh, some yeah, some formats for inputs and outputs that you expect from the model. And that, that works really well to make the output from the model um, more, um, uh, more uh, organized and easy to parse. Um, and then um, if, if that that that'll work for I think most applications. And another thing that you can do is tell tell the model to do something called a chain of thought. Um, and what it does is um, you you tell it to um, uh, uh, like run down like the how the model arrived at an answer logically, and that kind of helps the model make less errors. But then. Um, you know, you're generating more output, so your latency increases, your costs also increase. That, that's kind of like a disadvantage. And there's a lot of other techniques you can do after chain of thought prompting, but at that point, the costs get so, so high that it, you, it doesn't make sense anymore. You have to fine tune your model at, after that point. Um, another thing that's been becoming very popular recently is something called vector databases. Um, so the outputs from these models are like vectors, which are like long matrices of numbers. Um, so let's, uh, um, uh, and so what you can do is instead of querying the API, you can kind of save that vector. And if you have um, someone ask a similar question, you can query from that vector instead of from the API. Um, it works really well when you have like documents. So let's say you're, um, uh, let's say you, you're doing something like a document question answering thing, right? Um, so, you, um, so, 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 so you may provide, some, uh, so someone may have like a large document and ask multiple questions from it. So instead of sending that document to OpenAI multiple times, you send it once, save the embeddings, and then query from the embeddings, right? Saves costs and latency. Um, don't, like, don't use chains, don't use agents at all. They're not, um, they're not good at the moment. Um, any anything where you know the agents are completely autonomous will def will probably not work right now. Um, that's what we've seen, even with very simple um, uh, you know applications. Um, and then uh, another thing people do is like to to solve this issue is they have like another model, like a watcher model, which is also another LLM um, to watch the original LLM to make sure it's not making mistakes. It works sometimes, but if it doesn't work, you have the same, uh, you know, like snowballing effect where errors lead to more errors, and then who watches the watcher, and and you know, it just becomes like watchers all the way down. Um, and then finally, like I want to talk about some best practices that we think uh, you should do. Um, so all of these are also best practices. Uh, but then another thing is like these prompts that you create while building your uh, product. 
they are now like your proprietary data. They are the equivalent of like um, an in-house deep learning model from like the old days, like 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 three months ago. Um, so yeah, save those prompts. Make sure they're not leaked. Um, it's very important that that you you know like that you treat them very um, as as important as like you know your a uh, your API keys or something. Um, and then uh, for prompts as well, uh, make sure you version them and you test them. You know, treat them like you would like any data. Um, and and for testing, you know, you have to make sure that the same prompt, the answers don't drift a lot, um, and the quality of the answers don't degrade over time. Stuff like that. Um, yeah. So so these are some general good practices, but I think we need like more from the community um, and from other people who are building similar products. And and you know, as we also come up with more, um, we, we build out our application. We'll we'll you know we'll share those best practices as well. Um, Yeah, um, so I wanted to give a quick demo before I sort of progress because I know like we have been talking a lot about LLMs and I also want to go back to the product and help you see like how it works. So yeah, over here you can see like a input and we uh, we tried using Chinese. So yeah, um, and um, yeah, you can see like when it converts, it says good, I'll take the numbers but it doesn't sound that good in English so you know you can take that text again and you can go ahead and formalize it so these are the three functionalities that we have uh, with like the Chrome extension right now it does these three things is summarization uh, formalization and then translate Um, I want to also show you the GitHub. So we do currently um, have, you know, um, GitHub to, yeah, like where we have hosted the project. So you can see uh, like the entire project and you can, we have also like raised up issues where you can go ahead and see those issues and contribute back. Again, like this is completely open source and we really uh, want people to go ahead and contribute because that's how, it will help and most importantly, I feel like both of us have like a tunnel vision where we just are looking at one problem, but there's probably a lot more to explore. And um, yeah, so this is like a short roadmap we see. Where we are right now is like something functional enough, it does something small. And we do feel like there's a lot more things to figure out. Like tone is for example right now only formalized, but what if someone wants to make it fun? someone wants to change it entirely. So I think it should definitely work out for that as well. And then uh, have like a better user experience. As Soha mentioned, both of us don't have backgrounds in that. And it's taking us time to understand what a customer might think. And it's mostly like how we interact with the extension. So if you are someone who has that experience, we would love for you to contribute. And finally, like we are definitely dependent on the community to take it forward. Uh, we are writing more about our, you know, journey as such on the newsletter but definitely like welcome you to also do so so if you have interested you right now especially with our you know llm rant <laughs> i would uh, go ahead and tell you how you can contribute so there's obviously back end uh, ways that you know you can help build uh, build the product and the api as such this front end development as well as i said improving the front end features this newsletter content and we'll share you the newsletter as well we're trying to sort of journey this entire, uh, you know, Chrome extension. And um, you can, if you love writing, you can go ahead and send us and we can for sure put it up on our newsletter. And finally, infographics, the infographic that you saw I created, I feel like uh, making infographics is very soothing. So if you're someone like me, <laughs> uh, do let me know and do contribute to the infographics. And yeah, um, yeah, reach out to us and um, you know, finally also want to show you the newsletter. So this is our newsletter. It's tinyml.substack.com. We actually covered one yesterday as well uh, about the LLM conference as well. I don't know how many of you attended. It was way uh, in the night, but yeah, uh, you can also check that out. And Soham's latest, uh, <laughs> whatever he told you right now in a blog format. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, the end, but yeah, Feel free to ask us questions, you know. Um, I know like this topic seems very 
complicated i mean it's i i feel like gpt definitely like open ai definitely has made a great interface to interact with it but what happens behind the scenes seems quite complicated and we also started out like you know only a couple weeks ago so you know feel free to ask us questions you know don't worry about your questions sounding naive or something because you know we also started off if nothing it can you know your questions can also help us and vice versa <laughs> so yeah does anyone have any questions yeah hi uh, yeah you mentioned about uh, vector databases in a question answering app, how would you go about matching the query to a say to vector? Yeah, um, so you convert the query into a vector as well, mm -hmm. and then you kind of search for similarity in the um, in the from the database to the query um, query vector. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you, so you just output with with a very similar um, uh, yeah with yeah you just find the similar vector and output that. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure ChatGPT does something similar. If you go to ChatGPT and ask something like, summarize this archive paper for me and give it like an archive link. So let's say an archive link from like um, a few months ago, right? Which it's not trained on. Um, it'll find like um, in its vector database another archive link from like from when it was trained. So it might so you know archive links are like two one zero four dot one two three four. So it might find like two zero zero four dot one two three something like that and yeah so just something similar and output that okay. yeah so, so so something like um, some border pick cosine similarity between yeah yeah, yeah exactly so kind of like yeah cosine similarity is is, is one of the I'll, yeah one of the ways you can find similarities yeah okay, awesome thanks okay. uh yeah hi. i've got a question on there uh two questions so um for the, uh, at least as of, as of GPT-3, it leaned heavily towards English um, content. And I believe it's also true. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how tr I'm true. That I haven't checked how true that is of GPT-4. Uh, but based on your observations and going back to the idea of accessibility, um, how have you observed um, its performance in other languages um, other than, say, English and Chinese, like, say, uh, Vietnamese, Thai, or Indonesian? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, neither of us know any of those languages you mentioned. We've tried with Hindi and like uh, Bengali and Archana knows Tamil, so it works pretty well on that. Um, yeah, um, also like we've just tried with very simple like business use cases. So not like really long texts or like articles or something, but yeah. like small paragraphs that you might write in an email or in a, um, in a Slack message, something like that. Yeah, and actually on that idea, so since the tool right now is primarily for translation, as, as the demo you're showing off. What was the consideration between just choosing the existing um, array of translation APIs out there, translation um, neural network APIs out there, versus like saying uses GPTs? Um, so I think like the art, translation is definitely like a part of it, but the idea is also to sort of use the sentiment, uh, the way that GPT was built, like because the fact is it can formalize, it can change those tones really well. And that's what we wanted to capture because oftentimes when you move from your native language to English, a lot gets sort of lost in translation. And we want to make sure that such users don't get left out as compared to people who usually speak English. So the idea is definitely translation, but an added part to it is this formalization. And I don't think there's an API that does all of that currently. And if there's something else on top as well we want, I think like Open, open AI is like GPT API provides us that. Or maybe even just to say cause the translate function uses one, uh, uses a trans cheaper translation API and the formalization just uses GPT. I mean, that, that would say cost. Um, I mean, the cost is like, we haven't actually seen the cost, right? Because uh, we use GPT plus and they give you like $18, right? So we haven't a up to a large scale and we have more users yeah. using it can we actually understand the cost right yeah good great questions um any, any other questions from the audience we've got two experts here who've been playing with gpt's since uh, the old days <laughs> which is a nice quote um any any other questions from the audience before we break for tea yes please 
Uh, hello, uh, I'm from China, and probably, uh, as you know, uh, we cannot easy to access Open API and like uh, chat GPT in China. Sometimes we can uh, find an agent. I uh, try to use the image search. Uh, okay, I ask chat, chat GPT to provide some images, but I cannot uh, get what I want. So, uh, uh, would you help to explain uh, what's the purpose of the uh, what's the principles of the image generation in the chat GPT? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, Thanks. We know that the latest version of ChatGPT can use images and, and you know, combined images and text. Uh, but they haven't released that uh, API yet. Uh, they've just shown us demos of it. Um, and then th there's other models that can, you know, do images and, and extract text from images and stuff like that. We haven't tried that yet. Um, regarding, like, not being able to access and all, um, so, uh, right now there's, there are a few, um, open source language models. Um, the problem with that is, um, it, it's very hard to host those models because you need a GPU. It's, it's pretty expensive if you want to get low latencies. That's something we want to work on eventually. Um, yeah, but we are just figuring out the logistics of that. Yeah. Yeah, good. I think one of the big learnings there is as you mentioned on cost is yeah. it's it's easy and quick to play with gpt but as soon as you want to go beyond yeah. just experimentation then yeah. you've got to take these other factors into consideration um still open for questions otherwise of course the speakers will be around outside and uh, over tea yeah, so i think so, we, sorry we, uh, yeah we'll be in the event hall on the in the women who code booth yeah. somewhere near there so yeah if you have questions you can always come there yeah Okay, thank you so much everyone.